addition to the content warning for transphobia and suicide, there's also cartoon nudity, although that's been a body. Um, my name is Coraline Ada MP. I'm 43 years old and I'm transgender. I want to dedicate this talk to the one person in the audience who's also transgender and afraid to come out. It's for you. I also want to start by saying that my experiences are far from universal. I'm speaking for myself and not tens of thousands of other transgender people. I live in a world where my existence is controversial. My daily life is a political statement. That's a big burden to carry. But I tried to do my best, and I learned some things along the way in my journey that I want to share with you today. In October of 2012, I stood in a train platform very much like this one in Chicago. The wind of an oncoming train was whipping out my trench coat. I wanted two things more than anything else. I wanted a cigarette, and I wanted to step in front of the oncoming train. What brought me to that place it was the fact that I was transgender, and I couldn't deal with that. Let me explain what I mean by transgender. I was male assigned at birth, but there's a mismatch between how I knew myself to be and how my body actually looked. Despite my certainty that everything was wrong, I was socialized to conform to male gender norms. There's a tug of war between my brain and my body. My internal picture of myself didn't match my external appearance. Every time I saw myself in a photograph or caught myself in the mirror, there was a jolt of non-recognition. This is something I would later come to understand was called dysphoria. The DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, defines dysphoria as discomfort related to a conflict between physical gender and gender identity. If you've ever been around a doctor, you know that if they talk about discomfort, they mean it's going to really fucking hurt. It's a kick in the teeth every day. Things got worse as I approached puberty. Puberty is tough for everyone, I know that, but imagine going through puberty for the wrong sex. The changes that were happening to me were irreversible. My vocal cords thickened, facial hair came in, my bones fused, all the side effects of the wrong hormones being produced by my body. I had no idea that there was a word for what I was. I had no idea that there were other people in the world like me. I had no vocabulary for identifying what was going on in my life. I had no community I could seek out. There were no friends that I had outside the three or four people I knew in my town of 400. I was sure that something was wrong with me, that I was mentally ill, that I didn't deserve to live. I was ashamed of who I was. When I did see people that, tend, that seemed to question their gender identities, they were the butts of jokes ridiculous figures on daytime talk shows. I knew that I wasn't like that. I wasn't like them. I hated them for what they were and how they let themselves be treated. I had constant thoughts of suicide. Forty percent of transgender people will attempt suicide in their lifetime. Many of them are successful. I was utterly alone. To cope, I constructed a second life for myself, doing my best to strike a compromise between who I knew I was and what the world expected of me. I have a memory from when I was about three or four years old of being in a stroller. My mom was pushing me, and this woman came up to us and said, Oh my God, what a cute little girl. And my mom said, He's a boy. And something in my head said, That's wrong. That's not right at all. What is my mother talking about? When I was five, my parents split up. My mother was very abusive and neglectful. But even after all the horrible things she had done to me, I used to fantasize about her kidnapping me and raising me as her daughter. And I would have forgiven everything she had done prior to that, if that were the case. So I learned to hide my feelings. Lego was my favorite toy, probably the same for a lot of you. I could build a lot of crazy machines, which was really cool, but I could also secretly build doll houses. I was always on the computer when I was a kid. I could lose myself and forget myself in programming. I lived in an intellectual bubble, free from physical constraints. This was a strategy that I adopted for most of my adult life. Later, when BBSs were around, and finally the internet, I found that I could experiment with gender identity, particularly in news groups in the IRC. I used to handle unlucky girl, because what could be more unlucky than being born with the wrong body? In my late teens and 20s, I experimented with being goth. This let me flirt with androgyny, let me wear makeup and grow my hair long, but I was still troubled. I even turned to magic and the occult in my desperation. I gladly would have sold my soul for 60 years of life as myself, my true self. At age 23, I learned that my girlfriend was pregnant, so I got married. I had a beautiful daughter. I concentrated on my family, I concentrated on being successful in my career, but I made a fortress around my heart and walled off all my emotions. The only ones I allowed myself to fear, feel were fear and anger because they felt masculine and safe and easy to understand. I was haunted. No matter how I tried to push down the feelings of wrongness, they only intensified. 
which brought me to a train station in Chicago in October of 2012. Something had to change if I was going to go on my life. I had to change it or it ended. So I decided to come out. I came out to my friends and family first, and they were very receptive. Recogn um, sorry. <laughs> in my professional life, I first came out to my friend Aaron Kalen and told him how I was afraid of losing absolutely everything if I decided to move forward with this. He said that it would be difficult, that I should build a community, a network around me of people who understood and helped others who would come after me. So in October of 2013, I stood on stage with Aaron, Corey, JC, and Ash. We announced LGB Tech. In the process of announcing our organization, I came out to an auditorium of 400 people as transgender. Later that year, my friend Evan Light invited me to go to Ruby D Camp and told me to come however I felt most comfortable. I really wasn't sure that I could do it. I really didn't know if the community would embrace me. But I did it, and they did too. I found that I was stronger than I had ever imagined. And I knew then that I could follow through on that decision that I had made. So DCAMP was my first professional exposure as a woman. And what was the reaction from my peers like? My friend Mel Rappin was very surprised at my choice of editor. <laughs> <laughs> so at 40, I decided to start my life over. Throughout 2013, I've been living what's called part-time, meaning that I presented female everywhere except at work. I began my physical transition, starting my hormone regimen on August 11th at 10.13 p.m. I, um, I had to come out to my parents, which was going to be really difficult. My father is a right-wing conservative, Fox News watching, Washington Ball listening kind of person. And I was pretty afraid of losing him. So I called him on the phone one day, and I was very circuitous and kept getting to the point. I was talking about things like, you know how you said you'd always love me no matter what? And, there are big things happening in my life right now. And finally he was like, what is going on? Do you have cancer? And I was like, no, Dad, I'm transgender. And there's this long pause during which I was pretty sure that I had lost my father. He lets out a sigh and he says, thank God, I thought you were going to tell me you were gay. <laughs> I decided to name myself after the two most badass and inspiring women I could think of, Coraline Jones and Ada Lovelace. I actually gave my parents the opportunity to give me a middle name. They came up with Raven and Phoenix. So I was like, thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs> when I first changed my name, there were no search results for my name, and now I totally own my SEO. <laughs> I started gender therapy. I finally felt like I was on a path. It was the scariest and hardest thing that I'd ever attempted, but I still had to come out at work. At the time, I was working for an apartment finding service located here in Chicago called Blank.com. has to do with apartments. I picked them because they were very corporate, very safe, and unlike the startups I've been working for for four or five years, they had diversity policies in place. So it felt like a good place for me to transition. In February of last year, my mentee, Liz Avenanti, who was running Girl Development in Chicago at the time, invited me to come and speak as Coraline to the group on open source participation by women. So I agreed to do it after wrestling with a lot of fear. So an email went out announcing the talk, and little did I know that the technical recruiter at my company was on the GDI mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> so I got an email from her saying, I can't believe your wife is also a speaker. We should organize a trip to go see her. So I had to tell her. I didn't want things going through corporate back channels, so I also went to my manager. After that, I did what any geek would do, and I came out via gist. <laughs> I told my boss that I was going to transition from male to female on March 1st. It was one of the toughest conversations I've ever had. The response I got was pretty negative. You're no longer meeting our expectations. Maybe this isn't the right place for you. So I had to start on a job search two weeks after starting transition. Imagine the awkwardness of being 13 years old at 40 and trying to find the confidence to sell yourself to a potential employer. I talked to my friend Olivia, who's also transgender, and she had some advice for me that I boiled down into this t-shirt. I uh, printed it upside down so that I could look down and be reminded that I'm not an imposter. I'm a badass who's skilled at many things. I finally found a job at a company called Instructure. I was very worried at first because they're a Mormon-run company, but they've been nothing but nice and accepting to me. I've been there for over a year now. I found that I've been not just accepted, but embraced in my personal and professional lives. The lesson that I learned is when you're not miserable, people actually want to be your friend. I started speaking out about my experiences, about the microaggressions that I endured, about inequality, about all the things that I've been afraid to talk about before, and people were listening. 
had the opportunity to write for Model View Culture twice. And in June of this year, I was named Entitlement Princess of the Month by some basement dwelling gamer hater for calling out an open source contributor on his transphobia. And if you look closely, apparently I am the mom. It's pretty cool. I was afraid that when I started transition, I wouldn't be able to speak anymore. I love speaking at conferences, but I spoke at 14 conferences last year. I gave a keynote at Great Wide Open. I closed out the Madison Ruby Conference to a standing ovation. I got to speak at RailsCon, and I was even flown halfway around the world to speak at RubyConf Australia. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> so I definitely found my voice, but there was a price that I had to pay. I lost my wife, I lost my in-laws, I lost my godchild, my niece, my nephews, my entire extended family. I decided to focus on the community that had accepted me. Giving back is one of my core values. So we co-founded LGB Tech, as I mentioned. I also have a project underway called Open Source for Women, which is seeking to move the needle on women participating in open source. I created the Contributor Covenant, one of the main codes of conduct for open source projects. It's been adopted by Angular, Angular and Bundler and Homebrew and Exorcism, RSpec, and even Mozilla. I co-organized Chicago Women Developers. This is one of our hack nights, and if you look, I don't know if you can see in the background, the faceless patriarchy watching all this. <laughs> I volunteered with Girl Develop It, an organization that provides learning resources for women who are just getting started in their tech careers. Through volunteering, by being out in the community, by making a political statement that I exist, I'm trying to break down barriers that stand between people like me and our success. Helping even one person makes all of these struggles worthwhile. I decided to be deliberate in rebuilding myself. Since I had pressed the big red reset light button on my life, I had decided that I had the privilege and perspective to start over. There were several things that I had to learn how to do in the process. I had to learn to let go of my ego. I had to learn that I'm not always right and that that's okay. I had to find my passion and live by it. I loved learning and teaching, finding opportunities for growth and giving back to the community. I had to learn to listen again. I had to learn empathy how to understand different perspectives, open myself up to new ideas, and challenge my existing way of thinking. I had to deal with imposter syndrome as much as many of us do. In my case, it was complicated by the gender identity issues that I faced. For that girl development talk that I was giving for the first time as Coraline, I got in a panic and I talked to Liz, and I said, who am I to stand before a group of women and tell them how difficult it can be for them in open source? And she said that I had a unique perspective having lived life in two genders, and that this would be something that would be valuable to the women in attendance. So what lessons did I learn through this process? More questions than answers. I have to ask myself why I was really afraid to pair program. This is really a side effect of the intellectual bubble that I was living in. That bubble was very fragile, and whenever I had to expose myself, I felt very, very vulnerable. Am I willing to be less declarative? I learned that when I express an opinion as fact, I shut the conversation down. I don't give the other, other people an opportunity to express themselves. I don't get the benefit of their thinking and experiences. I learned to listen with empathy and compassion, not rushing them to state my opinion, but taking the time to understand what someone else is, come, is talking about or coming from. And I became painfully aware of the privileges that I lost and the privileges that I still had. And I try and use my privilege to amplify other voices rather than speaking for them or over them. I had to recognize and appreciate nuances in conversation, which I want to talk about briefly. When I started paying attention to differences in gender communication, I realized that, realized that male communication is very direct, while women communicate on a much more nuanced level. Because I'm a geek, I liken this to HTTP requests. <laughs> so men just respond to men differently. If a man talks about having had a bad day, the other man is likely to commiserate. Men have an instinct, instinctive need to solve a woman's problem. So when a woman complains about her day, the man wants to respond with a solution. This can cause a real disconnect in what she was expecting to receive and what she actually got. Women tend to listen to other women with empathy. That means that their headers are matched and they're communicating effectively. So I will demonstration there. So um, when I gave it up, I understood I came to learn what this privilege really means, and I want to share some things with you. As a cisgender person, you have little fear of being misgendered. How many times have you been called by the wrong pronouns? Even by people with the best of intentions, we get othered. Damien wrote, cis people get pronouns, trans people get preferred pronouns. 
Cis people get gender, trans people, people get gender identities. This really isn't fair. As a cisgender person, you're rarely the subject or the butt of an unpleasant joke. You don't have to worry that the show that everyone's watching these days is going to have an episode ending in, but she's really a man. A trope that never fails to make me break down in tears. Even shows that are touted by feminists as being very proactive, like Veronica Mars, that uses trope in their episodes. As a cisgender person, you have unfettered access to bathrooms. An increasing number of states and localities are trying to pass so-called bathroom bills, which would prevent access by transgender people to the bathroom corresponding to their gender. Most of these laws incur civil and criminal penalties, making us choose between holding it or moving to another state. According to one study conducted in Florida, over half of the people surveyed did not agree that transgender people should have access to the correct bathroom. As a cisgender person, you have access to health care. Not only your basic health care, but the right to not be ridiculed or turned away by medical or hospital professionals. In this map, the blue states have no explicit policy regarding equal coverage in private insurance or state Medicaid for transgender people. The gray states have some protection, either through Medicaid or through private insurance, but not both. And only the dark blue states have both coverage, both um, guarantees for Medicaid and private insurance. As a cisgender person, you don't have to worry about passing. There are a variety of acceptable gender presentations for you, from high film to tomboy and everything in between. Thanks to stereotype threat, trans women are often judged as too masculine to pass, or so feminine that they're considered over-the-top parodies. As a cisgender person, you don't get questions about your real name. The process of changing your name, for me, cost over $600 and countless hours of effort. But I still get misgendered, I still get deadnamed by places like Amazon and PayPal. It's almost impossible to change all references to your old name. As a cisgender person, you can't be fired for living authentically. The gray states on this map offer no employment protections for transgender people. The blue states, the blue states offer sexual preference protection, but not transgender protection. And only the purple states offer employment protection for transgender people. But as I learned in Illinois, which does have these legal protections, we're also a right to work state, which means you can be fired without cause. And it's very difficult to prove that you were discriminated against. So by understanding your privilege, hopefully this helps you be a better ally. And there's some other advice that I'd like to give you as a transgender ally. If you're unsure about someone's pronouns, ask them, but ask them quietly and discreetly and away from a crowd. Be careful with your compliments. Never tell a transgender person that you never would have guessed that they were trans, or that they look just like a genetic man or woman. Recognize that words can hurt us. Even words that some people say they're reclaiming from being slurs. There are exactly two words that are appropriate for describing me as a transgender woman, and those words are transgender woman. Our body parts are off limits. Don't ask us about our bodies. You wouldn't ask a straight, cis a white male at a party if he had a penis. We're no different. Don't make assumptions about our sexual orientation. Gender is a distinct thing from sexual preference. And don't spout attitudes. Don't tell me that gender is performative. Don't tell me that gender is a social construct or that gender doesn't matter. Money is also a social construct, but you wouldn't tell a poor person that money is just paper. Finally, listen. Listen and amplify. Don't just favor us, but retweet us. These are the lessons I've learned in the three years since I decided that I needed to transition. I hope that parts of the story have touched you, removed you, or informed you in some way. I want to tell you that it's never too late to learn and practice empathy. I learned it at 40. I would encourage you to have the courage to be really who you are, no matter who that is. Thank you.